Hello guys, Colin here. Now, boosting an amp into high gain is something that I've mentioned before to be very desirable under many circumstances, but I've yet to go through the specifics about why I think it's a good idea or some of the history behind it. So, in these videos, my guide to boosting, I'll be letting you know my opinion on what's good, bad or otherwise about boosting, and I'll be giving you some insight into why we do this. To understand why this practice is commonplace, we need to go back and look at some guitar history. Towards the late 70s, musical progression was pushing the boundaries of what the available technology could supply. Rock was huge and bands wanted to sound much louder and heavier than those that had come before. To produce the levels of distortion required for the type of music that people wanted to make, you really had to run a valve amp on 10, pushing the power section and the speakers hard to achieve maximum overdrive. At the same time, the newfangled transistor amps were coming out, and while they were cheaper and easier to maintain than their valve counterparts, many of the early ones sounded like shit compared to the classic valve amps that guitarists were used to. With this problem facing the industry, many companies started to produce effects pedals that would run alongside transistor amps to help them sound more valve-like. One such company was Nishin, a Japanese manufacturer who was making pickups and other parts for Ibanez. By 1979, Nishin had produced for Ibanez the TS-808 Tube Screamer and, due to an unusual business arrangement, were allowed to sell the exact same pedal under their own brand name, Maxon. At the same time, Roland were producing the Boss OD-1, a near identical pedal to the Tube Screamer, also trying to replicate that valve sound. Now, while these pedals were created with the best intentions, it quickly became clear that these little boxes alone weren't enough to replicate the sound of a real valve amp. But that doesn't mean they weren't useful. Many players decided to put these pedals in front of a roaring valve amplifier using the volume of the pedal to boost their guitar signal. When this strengthened signal hit the valves in the amp, the valves were suddenly pushed harder than the amp alone could drive them. This created a high gain distortion sound that simply wasn't possible before. It's very important to realise here that the extra distortion is not coming from the pedal but from the valves themselves and that's the beauty of these kind of effects. Essentially in simple terms valves work by limiting the flow of electrons from one end to the other using a control grid. By changing the signal going through the control grid we can either increase or decrease the flow of electrons passing through the valve. When you apply your guitar signal to the control grid then this is your playing that controls the valve. The harder you play, the more the valve opens up, and that's why valve amps have such a good touch responsiveness. Play lightly and the valves clean up, but hit hard and they really roar. Now imagine your weak guitar signal is first passing through a pedal which is boosting the signal level. Now when that boosted signal reaches the control grid, it can let through many more electrons than before, producing a red hot high gain guitar sound that was created within the valves themselves. Going through the 80s, these boosted distortion sounds really shaped the technologies and sounds coming out of the hair metal era. Amp companies were looking to cram much more distortion into the preamp section of their amps so that guitars get these high gain sounds without having to max out the volume on the amp, ultimately changing the way we generate our sounds forever. Pedal manufacturers seeing the success of the Ibanez and Boss models started to produce a whole range of low overdrive pedals designed specifically to send amps into high distortion and colouring the sound in lots of different ways. While the Tube Schemer was loved by many, there were still others who disliked how it changed the tonality of their sound. Being designed to make a transistor amp sound much more like a valve, it featured a prominent mid-EQ, and while that works for many situations, it didn't work for the sounds that everyone wanted to create. So it was a great call for effects that could push the valves as hard as the screamer, but with more transparency in the tone. Fast forward to today and you can't move in a market full of high-end clean boost pedals that claim to be totally transparent, or to make your tone thicker, or to cut this frequency, boost that frequency, the list goes on. Despite advancements in amp technology, where most modern amplifiers have more gain than anyone could possibly ever need, the practice of using some form of pedal to boost an amp drive the valves and colour the EQ is still massively popular. It's difficult to explain but there's just something magical about chaining up a good boost pedal with a distorted guitar tone and producing the perfect high gain sound. It's just something that feels right to us still. Next time I'm going to look at my favourite boosting pedals that I own and I'm going to compare the way that they change the sound of the distorted amplifier. So if you're interested in seeing that you might want to consider subscribing and that will pop up in your subscription feed when I get it out. I'm also available on all the social media and you can leave a comment in the comment section below and tell me what your favourite boosting pedal or boosting experience is or do you do something different entirely? But anyway, that's all for now. So keep it loud and I'll see you later.